Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Differentiated Instruction, Collaborative Conversations, presented by Education and Business Programs here at UCI Extension. Today is May 27, 2015. Very happy that you all could join us here today. Thank you for being here. To begin, full disclosure, this webinar session is being recorded and the archive of this session will be available within 24 hours. If you signed up for this webinar through UC Irvine's Extension's free events website, you will automatically receive an emailed link to this recording once it's posted, which again will be sometime bright and early tomorrow morning. If for some reason you do not receive the emailed link tomorrow, you can access the archive manually by going to uci.webex.com clicking on the Event Center tab, and then selecting View Event Recordings. Several webinars will be listed, but simply search for the title of this webinar from the list provided. The link will also be posted on the UCI Extension website on the GATE and other education programs pages in the very near future. My name is Daniel Powers. I'm the Program Representative in Education and Business Programs here at UC Irvine Extension. Today I'm speaking on behalf of my director, Angela Jante. Here's a brief overview of what we'll be covering in today's webinar session. First, I'll be giving a brief overview of the features of WebEx so that you'll know how to submit questions throughout the presentation. After that, I'll give you some information about UC Irvine Extension's brand new student-centered learning specialized studies program, officially launching in the fall, but we do have some classes available coming up in the summer. Then I'll turn it over to our presenter today, Katie Hickox, and at the end of the presentation, we will have a brief Q&A session. Finally, I'll be reiterating our contact information if you have any questions we did not get to address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during this webinar, please send a chat message to UCI Robert and he will help you troubleshoot any issues you might have. If you have a question for Katie uh, regarding the content of this presentation, please submit that in either the Q&A box or the chat panel. If it's, not, if it's not addressed during the presentation directly, we'll address your question at the end of the session when there's time. The chat panel should show up on the right side of your screen. When you send a chat question, make sure you send it to both host and panelist to ensure that I, as well as Katie, will see that question. You can also submit your question into the Q&A panel as shown on this handy slide. So this webinar is part of the inaugural event of the Student-Centered Learning Specialized Studies Certificate Program. So we're very happy to see everyone who's logged in to be with us uh, today. Uh, this is a brand new program, about a year in the making. It seems like we've had 100 separate meetings and countless hours of research on this, uh, on this program to bring teachers and administrators and homeschoolers uh, and tutors this vitally important content. Uh, so with the release of the new state standards, which promote cognitive-based strategies aimed at increasing learner growth and topic understanding, teacher training in the modern learning theories, and practical skills for cognitive coaching has never been more vital. The Specialized Studies Program in Student-Centered Learning will introduce and reinforce methods in student-centered learner instruction and guide students with immediately applicable classroom practices based on the most recent learner theories. This truly is an innovative, an innovative curriculum, and you'll see some of the theory behind it in today's presentation. And if this content is of interest to you, we're offering the course of the same name, uh, Differentiated Instruction, in the fall quarter. Our program is designed for a number of different audiences. As I mentioned in the previous slide briefly, this specialized studies program is designed for uh, teachers, teaching aides, tutors, education coaches, administrators, instructional designers, curriculum specialists, and individuals seeking a career change or professional development to improve their own teaching practices. And this specialized studies program consists of five required courses entailing 12 units or 120 hours of instruction. Students must complete all courses with a grade of C or better, as well as complete a candidacy declaration form. It is recommended that a student takes two to three classes in the program before applying for candidacy to make sure the full program is one they want to commit to. And when you're in the last class of the program, be sure to submit a request for certificate as well. 
As previously mentioned, the certificate program consists of five courses. These courses are listed here. Building Cognitive Curriculum, Differentiated Instruction, Motivation and Responsibility in the Student-Centered Classroom, Student Assessment and Measurement, and Career-Based Learning. These classes can be taken in any order and there are no prerequisites. You also don't have to commit to take the entire program if you'd only like to take one or two classes from the program. However, if you do intend to take one or two classes and possibly complete the other requirements in the future, please keep in mind that all courses must be completed within five years to receive the Specialized Studies Certificate. Each course has a tuition cost of $450. We frequently offer discounts to cohorts of individuals or teachers from the same district or organization, so if you're interested in a cohort discount, please contact our offices for details. Some courses will require a textbook, and the information for the required course materials is posted on the course enrollment page when registration opens. There's also a one-time candidacy declaration fee of $35, which also covers the cost of the certificate request. Each course is paid for individually at the time of enrollment, and again, you do not have to declare candidacy until you're ready to commit to the whole program. So, <clears throat> again, if you like the content of today's webinar, good news, as I mentioned previously, and as you may have seen on the course slide, differentiated instruction, the full class version, is one of the required courses uh, in this program, and it's being offered in the fall quarter. The course will be taught by today's presenter, Katie Hickox, and will begin near the end of September. Uh, Registration is now open for summer classes, however, which include building cognitive curriculum and motivation and responsibility in the student-centered uh, classroom. And you can search for the classes on our website at extension.uci.edu. You can click on course search and type in the keywords from these classes, cognitive or curriculum or responsibility or classroom or any combination of those and you'll find the class that you want. Again, registration for summer 2015 quarter is open now. You can see the course details and register for the classes at any time on our website, or when it comes time to enroll, you can do so by calling Student Services at 949-824-5414. Likewise, if you have any questions about financial aid, class locations, UCI policies, or if you just want to chat, they'll be happy to talk to you. So. At this time, I'm going to go ahead and hand over the presentation to today's presenter, uh, Katie Hickox. How are you doing today, Katie? Thank you for being here. Oh, I'm, I'm doing quite well. Thank you so much, Danny, and thanks for having me. And thanks to everyone who's joined us today. I know it's a school day, and um, a lot of us are also enjoying a work day, so thanks for taking some time out to be with us here at UCI. Um, today we're going to talk about collaborative conversations, and um, this is a huge movement in um, the education sector, um, but not something unusual to those of us who are in the private sector. Before we begin, I want to give you a little bit about my background. Um, I have taught grades 2 through 12. Um, I am GATE certificated in addition to working here um, in UCI Extension, and I've been a Teacher of the Year. Um, in my school district and uh, also uh, recognized here at UCI. In addition to teaching, I've done some program management. Uh, we've worked uh, more recently at our high school to co-coordinate an AP program. Uh, I have a great colleague I work with, and I've also coordinated an elementary gate program. So um, with that experience, um, I'll be speaking to you today, to you today both as a teacher and as a program manager. And also, I have a third hat I wear, I'm a parent. <laughs> um, so I'm curious if, it's, if we're able to find out, do we have any teachers in the audience or what are the background of the folks that are in the audience? If you'd like to share, please feel free to, to type it on chat and let us know a little bit about um, who we're talking to today so we can tailor our comments to you, the audience. So feel free to share that. Um, today, what we'll cover in our presentation, we're going to be looking at um, what are the key elements of differentiation. We're going to ground ourselves in that. And as Danny said, that's not only a course here at UCI, but it's a, a movement in education and a way of teaching. So we want to ground today's presentation in that. And if you want to learn more about these key elements of differentiation, Danny's right. We have a whole course devoted to it at UCI. Um, within that discussion, we're also going to look at collaborative conversations. What is that movement uh, and where does that play in with uh, differentiation? 
We're going to look at the common core standards that have been adopted by uh, 43 of our states uh, here in the United States. Um, we're going to be looking at the basic skills that collaborative conversations call for, and then looking at differentiating those skills and assessing the student's progress with those skills. So thank you so much. Um, for our differentiated instruction, we have a quadrant. Um, and this quadrant comes from the California Association for the Gifted. Um, it's also recognized by the National Association for Gifted Children and other organizations that really focus in on differentiation. For those uh, elements of differentiation, we're looking at four. We're looking at adding depth, we're looking at adding complexity, we're looking at adding novelty and adding acceleration to any core standards that we are trying to differentiate. And so today, when we talk about the core standards, we're going to be talking about the common core standards. And you can see that the core standards are in the middle of the quadrant, and on the outside of the quadrant, we think about how to differentiate. So for today's discussion, we'll start first in the middle of the quadrant and talk about the core standards and then work our way to the edges of the quadrant and look at how depth, complexity, and novelty in particular apply to this particular set of standards. And I did want to just call out once again that differentiation is a large topic, and if you want to learn more about all four quadrants, um, our differentiation class is a great place to do that. Okay, when, when we differentiate the student work, we look at that content, and that's the uh, core standards that we talked about earlier. Um, the middle of the quadrant, if you were. And then we also look at differ differentiating the process, how do students learn? So um, do we change the way we guide our lessons? Do we write our lessons a little bit differently? Do we provide different lessons for different students? Um, so that's looking at process. And then product is what the students make. This is what students um, uh, are able to do to prove their learning. We have students do a host of things in our classrooms to prove their learning from taking tests, writing essays, making posters, making movies. Literally hundreds of products can prove learning. So when we think about differentiating for process, uh, for content, and for product, we're going to be looking at collaborative conversations. And we'll back up and first talk about, well, what are collaborative conversations? And how do the Common Core Standards call them out? Well, collaborative conversations are nothing new in education. Students have worked in collaborative groups for decades. Those of us who have taught with any amount of experience know that small groups have been a big working structure within classrooms. What's different? Well, the Common Core Standards have transformed that traditional group discussion into a measurable skill set. Um, they're called speaking and listening standards, and they're actually accessible under these Common Core Standards. Um, our presentation today is going to consider the standards as content when we think about that quadrant of differentiation. And we'll look at how best to, how to model the standards as content first, and then we'll think about differentiating them. So stay with me for a while while we look at the standards, and we have a short standard study. When we do uh, study these standards, we want to think about, well, are we going to be having content, or are we going to be having product with our standards? I think the standards are very clear that they're content at first, and then we deliver a product that bases itself learning on how we've shown those standards. So collaborative conversations are a form of content, if you will. Once we as teachers learn how to teach that content, that's the what, <laughs> then we're ready to differentiate the how. How do we uh, deliver these co uh, collaborative conversations in the classroom? both for students on a college prep track and for the regular education students that we might deal with, as well as our differentiated uh, GATE students. Well, about that standard study, what do the Common Core Standards say? Well, across this Common Core Standards, whether you're looking at kindergarten, first grade, 11th grade, or 12th grade, there's some common language, and you can see it highlighted on the slide. Um, Common Core Standards specifically um, call out that students participate in collaborative conversations with diverse partners. Remember that phrase. You're going to see it a lot during today's presentation. That they follow agreed upon rules, and that students know how to respond in their conversations, that they know how to ask questions. So what you're looking at on the slide, you're studying grade one literacy standards. These are standards not just for English language arts uh, classes, but for social science, for science technical subjects. 
Um, and it's expected that the teachers are modeling these skills as early as kindergarten or first grade. Now what's kind of interesting, same thing. <laughs> so if you look back at our earlier slide and you look at some of that language, diverse partners, here it is on grade 12, and also expected for grade 11, um, posing and responding to questions. The print is small because the expectations are higher. Students really have to ask more complex questions. They have to be able to create uh, the democratic discussion rules and to synthesize responses that then solve problems at the 11th and 12th grade. But if we flip back to the earlier slide, it all grounds itself in talking with a diverse group of people, following rules when we talk to people, knowing how to respond to people's questions, just like we might in a webinar or a discussion at work, and asking questions to clear up confusion. So these basic standards show up throughout the continuum of grades kindergarten through 12, and these common elements are really what a lot of the instructional leaders are looking at today. Take Douglas Fisher and Nancy Frey. They published an article recently in Instructional Leader, that's for a publication of the National Association of Secondary Principals, that looks at where do we need to have these opportunities for collaborative conversations. Instructional leaders, whether they're principals or Frankly, I consider teachers leaders. We all are the CEOs of our classrooms. We need to be looking day in and day out for ways for students to interact in a group, and the groups need to change. They have to be diverse. We need students to on the fly agree upon rules for discourse, and we need them to be able to form those groups, collapse them, and go into new groups and new partnerships. And you can see a photo from um, my classroom that's uh, posted right there. There's some students taking notes on a poster that they have contributed to as a group. So some of these uh, little conversations don't have to be quick. They can be small and, and they can be fast. Well, what kinds of modeling needs to happen uh, in order for us to be able to have these collaborative conversations? There's a series of specific skills that students really need to look at. They need to look at first how do they talk, how do they ask questions, how do they address one another, um, and how do they choose their words? What kind of academic language do they use? And UCI has a great recorded webinar from a couple of weeks back, perhaps a bit more, that looks at academic language. So while we'll cover that a little bit in this presentation, you have some resources out there that are really great on academic language. So let's talk about the skills modeling. How do students choose their words and how do they craft their questions? You really do need to model to your students how do they ask or clarify questions? And this slide here gives some of the possible stems or uh, partial sentences that we might model to our students. We might ask our students, I would like to know more about, or what are some of the reasons for? These are things that, as adults, we'll ask one another all the time, um, but we don't always model that language to our students. What differences are there between this topic and that topic? And then, of course, Sometimes people don't agree. We see it in our classrooms all the time. After years of teaching third grade, I have to say, <laughs> recess duty was both one of my favorite things and one of the things that was difficult for me because that's where we really resolve a lot of these disagreements. Students wanting to use the tether ball but having to share. So any of us who have had that yard duty, we know um, that we do need to teach students how to disagree and build on ideas respectfully. Here's some ideas for what question stems for those. We might tell our students, you make a good point, but I maintain that because, and urge students to insert their point of view and, and their reasons why they believe it. Or building on this idea, I would like to offer, or we may differ on. And again, the students put their point of view in the blank. So we may differ on whose turn it is to use the tether ball, but perhaps we can find a, a compromise. So the blanks um, are where the students put their points of view, and teachers really are going to need to model that. A lot of teachers I know take these kinds of stems or these partial sentences with blanks and uh, type them up, blow them up onto a poster, and laminate it. Keep it posted in your classroom so that you have the stems available. Whether students are in first grade and they're trying to resolve a disagreement over a tetherball, or they're in 12th grade and they have a powerful feeling about a current contemporary issue, I think students really can use this modeled language. 
So model language is a really big part of how we prepare our students to be in collaborative conversations. And whether they're gifted or um, the students are struggling to learn, um, skills modeling is, I think, really a basic block that you have to put down before you look at differentiating that instruction. So how do we model those question stems? Well, as I said, you can make a poster in your classroom. You can laminate it and post it up there. Um, another great idea, and we have some pictures of this later in the presentation, are to type up these conversational stems or questions that you'd like the students to discuss onto cards um, and laminate those and have the students take a card uh, and use a stem. You can also have students use notebooks and keep their stems in their notebooks if you want to photocopy them and, and place them there. Um, I like to have students reinforce one another for using a stem. So going back to our earlier slide, if a student were to hear another student say, building on this idea, I would like to offer, and then giving a respectful point of view that may differ, Perhaps that student who heard his or her peer could offer a point on the assignment uh, subject to the teacher's agreement. Or uh, when I taught younger kids, maybe if you got enough of those, you got to uh, have a little bit of a treat at recess or something. So having the students reward one another for the use of the language that you want them to use um, puts the focus back onto the students and off of the teacher. Often we have quite a bit of grading to do as we need to get through on other common core standards. So teaching the students to manage themselves and to reinforce good behavior themselves uh, can help lighten that load for us. Um, how else can we model and check to see that the students understand the right language? We can offer them simple checklists um, to motivate the use of the right language. Uh, those checklists, the standards are a great place to start. You know, going back to our earlier discussion of the standards, the standards are actually very simply written, especially at the earlier grades. Um, if you uh, were to take some of these sentences that you can see in, this, in the slides, and I've clicked back to them, turn ask questions, that's at the bottom of the slide, to clear up any confusion about the topics or the text, that could be an item in a checklist that you use as a grading tool. Um, and that's actually what I did in my own high school classroom as I took that high school, uh, high school um, language and we looked at uh, making that into a checklist. Well, how do we model the vocabulary that's needed? I think the best way to do that is to give it to the students in a way that they understand it and really to break it down into three groups. And I see there being three total types of, of word choice or three types of academic language that we can uh, consider. The first type is colloquial diction, and that's the language of conversation. It includes contractions, uh, text message vocabulary if you teach the older kids, uh, and lots of pronouns depending on any age really. Um, so colloquial is the first level of uh, diction that we have in conversation, and it is kind of the currency of the world. If, if we can't have basic conversations, the world doesn't go round. So there's nothing bad about colloquial diction, but we don't necessarily want the students using it in an academic conversation. So we need to call it out as something that's unique and, and different and uh, to teach the students, well, what is colloquial diction? If I taught younger kids, um, and I did for a lot of years, I taught second, third, and uh, even seventh grade, I would think about maybe calling that everyday discussion or everyday talk. Uh, you don't necessarily have to call it colloquial diction, although I do think Students will learn what we teach them, so you, you could give it a shot. Um, elevated diction is where you really want to center much of your academic discourse. Um, you want to look at the upper level of the vocabulary for your grade level and concentrate on having students use fewer pronouns and lots of concrete nouns. Uh, if they're discussing uh, inventors in science or uh, developments in genetics uh, in that same field, um, they may use a lot of proper nouns to talk about the geneticists or the inventors. Uh, and you really want them to use as much of that elevated diction as they can, and it's not something they're used to. So I think that's something that we do have to call out. You know, earlier I mentioned that we've, there's a lot of great presentations out there, and, and UCI is one place that uh, has offered them, about teaching vocabulary. It's a whole other topic of instruction separate from uh, collaborative conversations collaborative conversations, and it's worth looking into. Um, while we're not really talking about teaching vocabulary too much in depth, we are going to give you a couple of strategies. 
Well, how do we teach vocabulary? On the right hand side, you can see a picture of me and um, don't make fun of my hair. Uh, there I am uh, drawing a tree map. And I don't know if, if any of you have used the thinking maps, but I love to use them uh, to introduce topics to the students. And so I don't know if you can read in the picture, but at the top of the tree map, it says three levels of vocabulary. So basically what we just talked to you guys about, um, the different levels of the vocabulary, that's what we want to teach the students. So level one, we have that colloquial diction or everyday talk. Level two, we have academic discourse. That's elevated diction. It's the talk of academia or work. And then level three, that's your domain-specific language. That's where you're looking and, and Common Core urges us to go in this direction to use the language of the discipline. So when I drew that tree map on the right, I actually colored, and you can see me coloring, um, each of those three levels or tiers uh, a different color. And I like to color code my instruction from time to time. When I introduce the, stu the three levels of diction to the students, I then ask the students, and you can see going clockwise down, to take a recent essay that they've typed up and color code it as well. Uh, go ahead and choose their colors to uh, highlight the level one diction, the level two diction, and the level three diction. And again, those levels or, or tiers might be everyday conversation or colloquial, uh, academic conversation, which is what we're talking about today, and then domain specific. It's very specific to a language or a discipline. And, and we do want our, our collaborative conversations to have a bit of the domain specific. If you're having a discussion in your mathematics class and they're not using mathematical terminology to discuss biases and statistics, then you know, maybe we're not having the most selective and, and best conversation we could. So you really want your academic conversation to, to look at those three tiers. You want the students to be aware of the three levels. Um, and a good way to model it would be a tree map. So I actually drew that tree map, and then I asked the students to make a tree map of their own and to collect examples in their own tree map of everyday talk, the kinds of words that we use, of academic vocabulary that we've studied recently in our reading in our textbook or a, a story we might have read that week. Uh, and then tier three vocabulary, what kinds of words might we use in a research paper? Uh, on a specific and a narrow topic. Um, so when you're modeling your regular vocabulary program or your spelling program, if you're an English teacher, that's a great time to talk about levels of vocabulary. If we're teaching science and we're teaching math or maybe social science, vocabulary is a part of what we do, but we don't always talk about what kind of vocabulary. So this, too, is an opportunity. Um, these subjects, too, could also use a tree map that looks at the levels of vocabulary and differentiates that everyday conversation, that level one, the academic conversation, the formal discussion that we hope we have in class, and then level three, the domain-specific vocabulary that's very unique to our discipline, very unique to our math, very unique to our science. Um, so class posters, I love to use them, and I love students to have their own copies. I also, you can see in the very, very small uh, photo on the bottom on the left, I will sometimes post sentences on the board um, that uh, have common colloquial use, uh, you know, sentences that the students have, have written or said that maybe are a little bit more every day. And I'll ask the students come up, to come up and take my teacher marker and rewrite the sentence to be less colloquial and more academic or use a little bit more domain specific if we're feeling really specific. Um, so keeping the students aware of what kind of language do they use and um, using that language in a very conscious and deliberate way is a good way to prepare for collaborative conversations. When we talk about domain-specific language, we need to be uh, very focused. We want to talk about how that's the language of the discipline that the students are studying. So if you're having a collaborative conversation about astronomy in the third grade, they need to use the domain-specific language. You know, maybe there's vocabulary from your textbook or from your school district's uh, unit of study. Uh, recently, I had 10th graders re, uh, do some research papers. I'm an English teacher, and so they chose topics, and we uh, held ourselves to a certain number of references, even, to domain-specific vocabulary that had to do with their self-selected study. Well, now that we've talked about the different types of diction, what might we do to differentiate it? 
you know, we had to spend the time we did talking about building basic skills, those building blocks, those bricks, teaching the question stems, teaching the uh, response stems, teaching the, the academic versus the colloquial versus the domain-specific language. If we've built those blocks, now it's time for us to think about differentiation. And I really do think that Dr. Sandra Kaplan has a great set of tools for us in her depth and complexity prompts. Sandra Kaplan, for, for those of you who may not know who she is, is a huge and, and prominent thinker in gifted education. She developed her depth and complexity icons, as she uh, they were once called, about, oh gosh, I don't know, 1990s, I want to say, and then built upon them um, with more and more of them uh, to give students and teachers a way of talking uh, in their classrooms. Well, what are collaborative conversations, but they're talking. Um, so I'm a huge fan of Dr. Kaplan's work, and I really do see uh, a great place for uh, us to differentiate there. So back to uh, where we, be we began, we looked at our differentiated instructional quadrant and we looked at depth, we looked at complexity, we looked at novelty and acceleration. In the very center, we talked about these core standards or what are the common core standards? And we talked about how they call out these standards for working with diverse partners. The standards ask that students learn how to select their words and how to speak academically, how to ask questions and how to clarify. So how do we take those basic core standards and differentiate them for depth and for complexity? Well, we could ask the students um, to elaborate, to give us evidence of their points of view. We could ask them to generalize the different points of view that might conflict with theirs and to define any gray spots or ambiguity. Dr. Kaplan has icons for nearly all of these ideas and these skills. On the right-hand side, you can see some of her prompts. Uh, her details prompts uh, is the flower picture. That's where we ask students to give us details. We ask them to elaborate. So what a perfect way to start the conversation. Um, this new icon that you can see that has a magnifying glass, and I'm sorry I keep saying icon, I should be saying prompt. Um, <laughs> That new prompt is called Proof, and it's a new favorite of mine. It's uh, calling out that students use evidence to back up their, their discussions and use evidence to back up their positions, whether we're looking at textual evidence, case studies, uh, good reasoning. So this evidence um, is an important element of a good conversation, and uh, Proof is a great icon for it. Trends, patterns, these are all uh, depth icons and they're a great way to participate in a discussion. Now, I will say that while these icons are useful for debates, there's been a lot of discussion about our collaborative conversations debates. And well, I'll let you review those <laughs> that, that debate on your own. Um, I'll say that a, a collaborative conversation, I think, is in its nature collaborative, meaning that we're looking for a shared understanding. If you look closely at the standards, the skill that we're talking about here isn't necessarily defending a point of view as much as it is synthesizing a point of view into another one. So I do think we're looking more at a discussion and, and less at a debate. Well, how would we apply, apply the depth to the common core standards? Well, I talked to you about those icons earlier, the uh, details icon, asking students to elaborate, to respond, to um, give us a little bit more information, give us some proof, give us some textual evidence. Those icons are really useful for that. And then I like patterns because I do like students to look at things more than once, to really get into a text in depth or to an author in depth or perhaps into a genre in depth. Now we can also ask students to look and to discuss uh, the different topics uh, using complexity. Uh, they can use different points of view, changes over time, or even look at skills across the discipline. Um, these are the higher order skills, comparing and contrasting, the synthesizing we mentioned earlier, um, looking and revising our points of view. These are all, interestingly enough, they're Dr. Kaplan's thinking prompts, but they're also called out in the standards. So there's a debate that you might consider, are we differentiating or are we meeting the standards? I'd say that if we're adding enough depth and complexity, we probably are differentiating, but it is fascinating to me that Dr. Kaplan's thinking prompts really do, they mirror the standards so well. Well, what kind of collaborative work might we do? 
Well, we might ask the students to prove the integrity of the sources they use in a discussion. So if the students are having a discussion about the use of technology in the classroom, maybe they can bring in some articles and have the students evaluate, well, what's the credibility of the article? Um, what kind of authority does your writer have? Uh, what kind of currency or how current is the article? What was the purpose of your article? Uh, was it to persuade or was it to inform us? Um, so have the students kind of discuss and ferret out whether or not they have good sources before they even discuss it. The um, sourcing, I really think, is an important part of making a good discussion. The students have really solid articles um, that either the teacher provides or the students bring in, and when the teacher does provide it or when the students do bring in articles, that that's part of the discussion is why is that a good source? Um, so the University of Santa Cruz has a great uh, tool to look at the quality and the credibility of, of sources. And that thinking map you can see there in the, the picture kind of draws on that, that um, we look at not only what's the name of the source, but what is that authority of the source? How current is it? And what's the purpose of it? Is its purpose to convince us or is it purpose really truly to inform us. Um, so I think uh, talking about your sourcing is an important part of a collaborative conversation and Dr. Kaplan's proof icon is a great way to get that started. Um, and then, you know, below that you can see her process icon, you know, what kind of process do we go through? We might look at reasons, we might look at textual evidence, uh, discuss any anecdotes that back up the position, current events, case studies. Um, to really create a pattern of details that support your point of view. So talking about what your point of view is, but also giving evidence for it, and talking about the quality of your evidence, I think is all a good thing to do in a collaborative conversation. You can also use Dr. Kaplan's depth and complexity icons to model questions. Um, and what you can see on the right is a chart that has followed me from second grade all the way through <laughs> high school now. I love to have students use some of the depth and complexity prompts to guide their thinking. So for example, when I taught younger kids, um, I would teach them fairy tales and folk tales. And we'd make a process grid, that's what we called that chart that you can see there, of each of the fairy tales or folk tales that we read and how those fairy tales or folk tales showed Dr. Kaplan's thinking prompts. So what's the big idea of Cinderella? What's the lesson that we learned the theme? What's the lesson we learned from Jack and the Beanstalk? What's the lesson we learned from uh, Little Red Riding Hood? And how are all those lessons, if we kind of move next, part of any patterns that we see in traditional literature. Um, are there certain types of characters that show up again and again? Are there certain details in the plot that seem to repeat? Uh, it's been said that the number three sometimes shows up a lot in traditional literature. So what kind of patterns do we see? And then what are some of the ethical uh, discussions that these fairy tales or, or folk tales really do bring up for us? And when we think about those ethical discussions, you know, all three of those are Dr. Kaplan's icons and what great conversations the kids could have um, using these graphic organizers working together in a small group and collecting textual evidence to show, well, this is the big idea of Cinderella, or here is a pattern in that story. So you can have your students work on collaborative conversations, uh, creating a, a, a process grid like we showed you on the earlier slide, or you could differentiate by giving the students task cards and asking each group to address that task. So on this slide, you can see some of my task cards that I've used over the years that have Dr. Kaplan's thinking prompts on them. Uh, on the right, you can see how do details of the setting contribute to the mood and the passage in the text. We could ask the students to discuss that question and come up with uh, four or five pieces of textual evidence that answer it and some explaining sentences that also address it, have the students take notes on a thinking map, and then work individually to write a paragraph or to write an essay. Uh, so the conversation becomes a process that leads to the product of independent writing, and that's where your collaborative conversation fits in. You've differentiated it using the depth and complexity uh, prompts that Dr. Kaplan has, has designed. Some of the other depth and complexity questions that could lead to a good conversation, how does the author use patterns of details or origins and sentences, chapters, or other structures within the text? Uh, describe how a different narrative or perspective would change the details or any changes that had gone through the passage of the text. 
and how do changes over time in the characters contribute to the theme or the big idea of the story and the passage. So these task cards, you can laminate them and they can really apply to any story. If you teach a discipline other than English, think about broad questions that may cause the students to think about one topic and then maybe address another topic in a different way. And making task cards can then help the groups have something to look at. Um, another place you can design depth and complexity questions, you can see um, uh, on the top left-hand corner, you can uh, make a poster where you put your question at the top and you ask your collaborative groups to work together to come up with a good answer and put it on a sticky note. Um, I love post-it notes. Uh, so you either love them or hate them in your classroom, I love them. Uh, and have the students address the question in a small group post it up on the poster, and then that's really easy to check for understanding. You can look at their post-it note pretty quickly to see, you know, did they really discuss the question and did they get it? And does their answer reflect that good discussion? Um, a longer project might be on the right-hand side. Um, that's back to our process grid that we talked about earlier. I wanted to show you that in a picture. Um, this is our high school students looking at some of the depth and complexity prompt questions and addressing them uh, about some slave narratives that we've read. Uh, and then on the lower uh, end, you can see I've um, added some of the depth and complexity prompts to a flow map, and I'd ask some groups to analyze a passage of text for paragraph structure and to talk in their group collaboratively in their conversation uh, as a critique of what the paragraph structure was, and then they put their commentary on those sticky notes. So how else could you differentiate? Um, another big area of differentiation is Socratic seminars. And if you are interested at all in these next few slides, like depth and complexity, these are covered quite in depth in the differentiated instruction class. We have so much that we talk about with depth and complexity, and even more, we're actually on Socratic seminars this week in our, our differentiated instruction class. So what are Socratic seminars? Um, these two have been around for a while. They're a process. They're a way to have an academic discussion, and they do fit perfectly, I think, with the collaborative conversation standards. Um, what the teacher does for a Socratic seminar is to create an open-ended question, and it should be a pretty big question. Something like, is justice the same as fairness? Uh, that's a big one. The question should arise out of the reading of a single text, but can apply to many texts or to real life situations. Perennial question topics can include justice, fairness, justice, oh, I'm sorry, fairness, justice, truth, beauty, technology, friendship, love, discrimination, equality. Those are all good topics. Well, here, what are some more examples? Uh, I did ask my high school uh, English students to read a New York Times article that looked at sociological implications of cell phones. Uh, it's their favorite appliance. I asked the students, is technology designed uh, to bring us together actually pulling us apart? That was kind of the central thesis of the article. Um, another way to design questions is you can use depth and complexity prompts. Uh, we talked about those a bit earlier. Where else can you get good Socratic seminar questions? The College Board, <laughs> collegeboard.org, um, designs great questions that can use at a lot of grade levels. Look at some of these questions. How do characters from the past influence the characters of the present? Well, to me, that applies as well to Charlotte's Web as it might be to Arthur Miller's The Crucible. I mean, you can really use a, an elementary text or a high school text to address that question. And I modified that question from an AP exam question. In fact, all of those questions that uh, we look at on these AP exams or even the newly redesigned ACT or SAT, those questions can be modified for, for pretty much any grade level. What's fascinating to me is that the SAT is really aligning itself to Common Core quite a bit, uh, looking for that textual evidence for that proof that we talked about earlier. And the questions are supposed to be a little bit more interdisciplinary. So I'll wait to see those questions be released. I haven't seen too many online, but I think we're all gonna find a lot of good examples for collaborative conversations. We might have to adjust them for our grade levels, but I, I do think that that's gonna be a good source for us. Um, really any controversial issue within a discipline, um, statistics can always raise questions in mathematics. Um, anything that you feel would give the students some, some uh, traction in the discussion that you also feel is appropriate for your student audience, you have to take that into consideration. Um, that's a good source for a Socratic seminar question. Now, once you've decided on your Socratic seminar question, you want to post a written version of any rules that you'll have for your discussion. And that gets back to our earlier slide on 
how do we talk to each other? What do we say when we disagree? How do we get at that? You know, you'd want to have that posted pretty clearly and perhaps even some additional rules. So here's some rules that I, I used back when I taught third grade, and, and frankly, they're not bad for high school either. Uh, wait for your turn to speak. Positively acknowledge the previous speaker. Um, back to those examples we've seen earlier in today's discussion, I can appreciate your point. Thank you for your point. Building on your idea, I'd like to add to what Sally says. Um, a good rule to get out in front with your students, avoid personal comments and derogatory remarks. Um, you know, make sure that that's real clear to the kids. Uh, have them refer to the text and other relevant evidence in their comments, and have them avoid opinion without evidence. You know, we talked a lot about proof, and I think that both having them discuss the quality of evidence and what is good evidence is a good thing to do before you have a Socratic seminar. And then I just do like to have the students uh, uh, talk to each other. So make it a rule that they have to make a point of their own in the discussion, but also comment on another person's views. Ways to grade collaborative conversations. The picture on the right is me trying to get through a big pile of grading at the end of the semester. Um, I would suggest not having that uh, happen to you for collaborative conversations. We have enough essays to grade, enough tests in our other disciplines, and there are plenty of good rubrics online. Uh, if you Google Smarter Balanced Rubrics or even try Rubistar, those simple checklists are a great opportunity for that peer modeling that we talked about earlier in the presentation. Have the students give each other feedback, and then, you know, you do need to be a referee if you don't agree with their assessments. You can always change it. Um, but peer grading, I think, really does help the students be more aware um, of what they should be doing, and it does help us to avoid the situation we see in the picture. Um, and with that, um, what will we do to implement? collaborative conversations in a way that helps us to balance this end of semester grading and all the other things that we do. Well, to recap what we talked about today, you want to first model that content, model the grade level standards, model um, what is expected for collaborative conversations. And that was early in our presentation. We looked at the first grade standards and how similar they were to the 12th grade standards. So model them. You could try to differentiate with depth uh, using some of Dr. Kaplan's thinking prompts or complexity, uh, that source would be the same. Maybe try a novel process such as a Socratic seminar. Um, and then the thing that I wanted to touch on last today is maybe after their discussion, what will they do to show that they had a good discussion? Well, maybe they could make a video of their discussion. They could write a brochure on the topic, a comic strip, uh, models, posters. And yes, essays, we do need to write them. And that's another big part of our common core literacy standards that address all disciplines. The students do need to learn to write across the disciplines. So that's always a good place to go. Um, well, thank you very much for your time today on Collaborative Conversations. We have covered a lot of material in a short amount of time. If you enjoyed at all any of the material talking about depth and complexity, we really only scraped the, the surface. That's a big part of our differentiated instruction class. And if you enjoyed at all the discussion of the Socratic seminar, that too is part of our UCI class. So thank you very much for your time today, and I'll uh, be around for uh, just a couple more minutes if there's any questions. Thanks so much, Katie. Uh, uh, yeah, as Katie was saying, if you do have any questions, you can go ahead and drop those into the Q&A box or the chat panel, uh, and we can get to those uh, as they come in. Uh, or if you are listening to this and you do have questions uh, that are not covered in the uh, presentation, you can go ahead and email those to the email address that's on the screen right now, powersd at uci.edu, and we do try to uh, filter through those questions and get those answered for you. For those who are not able to attend live, uh, anyone who is watching the recording of this, so um, yeah, if anyone has any questions at all, feel free to drop those into the Q&A box or that chat panel. I guess it speaks to the quality of the presentation that there are no questions, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, Danny, I'm not seeing any, but perhaps uh, in my old age I'm getting blind and, and not seeing. 
No, <laughs> not at all. Well, uh, if there are no questions, we'll go ahead and, and wrap up a, a couple minutes early. So uh, again, if you have any questions at all, if you think of anything later, uh, go ahead and send me an email at powersd at uci.edu. I'll go ahead and forward your questions to Katie and we'll get those answered for you. And uh, here are the program contacts that I promised. My uh, program director is Angela Jante. Uh, again, my name is Daniel Powers. Uh, there is the snail mail address on the screen in case you want to send me a nice postcard or something. And of course, you can check out our website at unx.uci.edu. So once again, thank you so much, Katie, for presenting for us today. All right, well, thank you for having me, Danny, and thanks to all who attended. Indeed. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Have a fantastic day. Goodbye.